Um, I'm just going to start off today by telling you that there is an extraordinary revolution occurring in early child development. Uh, but since most of the people that are leading that revolution are actually sitting in this audience, uh, I think I'm going to skip over that part and try to tell you why we are so excited. And it really is something dramatic that's happening at an incredibly fast pace. And to give you some idea of what this is about, um, my students told me that over the last year or two, there have been all sorts of TED lectures on self-control. And that in itself is really very interesting. It reflects this awareness that self-control is as important and possibly more important than my cue for how well a child does in school. Um, we study self-control very carefully, but we do it from a sort of lower level. So let me start off by re-describing something that's been uh, in the news quite a lot lately, and that's Walter Michel's portion test. Everyone knows this task, because I've heard a bunch of people already talk about it. Uh, in the task, the experimenter comes up to a child who is sitting alone in the room and says, you can have one marshmallow now, or if you wait 15 minutes for my return, I'll give you two marshmallows. And if you have never seen this task, you can see it on YouTube. There are several, uh, there are several excellent uh, video presentations of the task. And it's funny, you know, you see the kids walking back and forth and they hit their head, doing everything they can to resist eating the marshmallow. What's so extraordinary about this task, it's called a delay of gratification task, what's so extraordinary is that you can administer it to a four-year-old child, and around 30% of the children can wait. 70% somehow or other grab the marshmallow before the experiment comes back in, okay? Well, Michelle, well, because he did this a long time ago, he started using it in the late 60s, he was able to follow up on these kids, and he made some extraordinary discoveries. What he found was that on average, the 30% who waited scored approximately 210 points higher on their college entrance exams. In fact, they did better in virtually every domain of both physical and mental well-being. They had stronger social relationships, they were less vulnerable to uh, addictive or risky behaviors, uh, they had stronger social uh, relationships, they earned more, so they did really well in life. Our clinic, the, the Milton and Ethel Harris Research Institute, we're interested in the other 70 percent. We want to know why did they have so much trouble with this task and what can we do to help these kids? And we know that this is a problem affecting an enormous number of children in Western society today. Now, it would be a, the subject for another lecture, why we think this is the case. For today, all that matters is that an awful lot of kids are having an awful lot of trouble resisting impulses, delaying gratification. And what the marshmallow test is telling us is that we want to intervene early. We want to figure out what can we do to help this child. And I had a sort of epiphany on this task a couple of years ago. Um, I had a, a blood sugar test, and my blood sugar was a little bit high. And so my wife immediately insisted that I not be allowed to eat any more refined sugar. <laughs> and uh, I had a very, very hard day at the office Everything that could go wrong did, and I got home late. And my children, who are also here, um, felt very sorry for their dad and bought me six butter tarts. <laughs> and they left the butter tarts on the dining room table. I got home late, and there were the six butter tarts, and I swear to God, I was just like these kids you see on the video, rocking back and forth, scaring them. <laughs> and about 30 seconds later, all six butter tarts were gone. Now, had it been a different day, had I had a good day, I wouldn't have eaten them. I would have heard my wife's voice. And I would have understood why I should eat them and that really everything was going so well, stick to the plan. 
So what was going on here? Well, what we did was, the very next morning, we began to research an area of psychology called ego depletion. And we have so many beautiful studies that have been done by people like Roy Gomez, showing that certain things are very taxing on a child. Just paying attention demands an awful lot of energy from the kid. So the kid needs a chance to restore, the child needs a chance to recover. Well, this is exactly the work we do in my lab. Because what we look at are children that, for one reason or another, are burning an awful lot of energy. Now, for a lot of these kids, they might be burning more energy because they're very sensitive to things like noise or, or uh, visual stimulation. And they're spending so much energy trying to stay regulated in an environment which is draining them, they haven't had enough left over to pay attention, let's say, to their teacher. Unfortunately, we tend to be irritated with kids with this. And so we might ignore them or we might get angry at them. And this actually makes everything worse. Because on top of the physiological strain on their nervous system, we know that positive emotions create energy. Positive emotions like love, interest, curiosity, happiness. They are a source of energy, but negative emotions, fear, anger, anxiety, frustration, are a huge drain on the child's nervous system. So by getting angry at the child, or by shaming the, by shaming the child, we're actually making everything worse. It's going to be harder and harder for this child to become regular. We had a very simple question that we asked. What happens to those 30% if we tire them out? What happens to, to these kids if, let's say, we make them do 20 minutes of the math question, which is very tiring for a little guy, and then re-administer the test? Guess what? Most of them can't, can't delay. Most of them can't pass the marginal test. Now, let's look at the other 70%. What happens to those children if we rest them up? And we can rest them up. We do it with active stretching. Uh, we play soothing music. We do deep breathing, just like you and I did yesterday, sweetheart. And guess what? Now they can wait. Most of them now have no problem delaying gratification. This is very interesting for us, because what it suggests is we make a huge mistake if we look at self-control as a muscle, as a strength. And we, we look at a child who has poor self-control as somehow lacking mental fortitude, lacking this internal strength to resist impulses. Rather, what we think is going on with these children is that they're spending so much energy trying to cope with stressors. And these stressors can be biological, or social, or both. They haven't got enough left over to pay attention to their teacher, to resist an impulse, to laugh when somebody does something rude. Well, this is exactly the work that we do at our clinic. And in fact, we just reported our results last week. And guess what? If we reduce the stressors on the child, if we figure this out, it is amazing how these children can begin to learn the sorts of things we want them to learn, like learning self-control or the lessons in school. I thought what I would do today is give you just one case example to try to illustrate this point. The point is very simple. The point is getting every adult, parents, educators, anyone who's working with the child, the physicians, to try to understand the child, try to understand what's going on inside the kid. Use these behaviors that you see, that you find irritating or annoying, as a sign that this child is under too much stress. And we have to figure out what are the stressors for this kid. The best way to teach this is with case examples. So this is one standard one that I like. We had a nine-year-old boy come in to see me, and he was obese. And the first thing I noticed when he walked into the office was absolutely no affect on his face. It was completely blank. Well, we always ask the same first question, uh, and that's tell us about your friends, because psychologists have known for an awfully long time that social relationships are the key to long-term mental well-being. 
So I said, tell me about your friends. And he said, well, he said, I've got friends all over the world. I thought, that's a very strange answer. I kind of thought maybe his father was in the military. And I said, well, tell me about, tell me about your best friend. He said, well, uh, my best friend is Prussian. He's a Romanian. I said, your best friend is Prussian and he's a Romanian? He said, yeah, he's part of my online uh, internet game community. So it turned out the child was spending hours every night as part of, as part of this online gaming community. And then I said to him, no, no, tell me about the friends you can actually see. And he said, oh, no, we all have lab cams in our, in our, on top of our computers. I said, no, no, tell me about the friends that you can actually be in the room with. Well, he had none. What was actually going on with this child, and this is, uh, I haven't got time to explain it properly, but the, the short answer is that this child had what we call a sensory integration disorder. He was having trouble integrating the information coming from his hands, his elbows, his deep muscles, his tactile sensations. So for this child, gravity itself was a huge stressor. He was spending huge amounts of energy trying to cope with walking, standing up, sitting down. What he naturally did was he self-selected that activity where he could avoid exercise, where he could avoid where he could avoid the one thing that he found highly stressful. But unfortunately, video games themselves are extremely energy taxing. So everything was getting worse. The trajectory was spinning out of command. And to make things, to talk everything else off, attempts to help this child ended up shaming him, ended up making him feel that he lacked willpower, that he lacked self strength So on top of this sensory integration problem, he had enormous problems in self-esteem, constant feelings of anxiety, this kid was constantly depleted. So guess what he did? He reached for fast, immediate sources of energy, soft drinks, junk food, to give him that sudden spike. And he wasn't doing the one thing he should be doing to stabilize his arousal system, and that's exercise. But to help that child, the last thing he wanted to do was exacerbate his negative emotions. Instead, we had to see can we get these systems talking to each other again? Can we get the sensory integration systems, the kinesthetic, proprioceptive, tactile, working together? Now, I can tell you, I don't know where Lori is, but Lori Nippus is right here. We have in, in our country some of the most wonderful therapists who know how to do this. And that's where we are today, and that's why we're so excited. We're excited because not only do we talk about reframing children's behavior, we actually have the people who know how to do this, how to work with these kids to get these systems functioning. So what's the final message? It's a very simple. What we understand today is there really isn't such a thing as a bad kid, ever. And there's never such a thing as a stupid kid. And there's never such a thing as a lazy kid. But if we do the wrong things, we will turn him into a bad, lazy, or stupid kid. What's happening in this country today is setting a standard for the rest of the world. We get emails all the time asking us how they can do it because we have understood this lesson. And what we're doing now is creating scale up programs that Don mentioned in the introduction so that we can get to every single child, help them get regulated, help them learn how to self regulate. And guess what happens when you do that? You unleash the potential. And every single day of my working life, I am astonished by some child. So that's my, final, that's my final message. What we're trying to do today is have a whole generation of kids who will do things that will just blow you away. Thank you.